In March 2012, Bolton Wanderers were playing Spurs in an FA Cup match that was being televised. During the match, Fabrice Muamba collapsed on the pitch. His heart stopped beating for 78 minutes while paramedics desperately tried, 15 times in fact, to revive him. The 15th time was successful. He was revived and he recovered and is in good health, although not allowed to play football anymore. This is what Moamba said. It shows how fragile life can be. At any given moment, it can be taken away. It's a lesson we should all heed. You have to choose life. And Easter is about choosing life. 2,000 years ago, everybody knew Jesus Christ was dead, killed as a result of the horrific execution by crucifixion. Just to make sure he was dead, a Roman spear was thrust through his side. There was no paramedic around. There could be no paramedic around who could possibly revive the stone-cold body 
of the Lord Jesus as it was laid in a cave tomb with a huge stone rolled across the entrance. He wasn't there for 78 minutes. He laid in that tomb for three days. And on the third day, he rose triumphantly from the grave, showed himself alive to his disciples at different times and places. He showed himself alive to larger groups of people, up to 500 at one time, were convinced that they had seen and spoken with the risen Lord Jesus. And today, all these years later, Christians around the world continue to celebrate on Easter Sunday this wonderful fact that Jesus died and rose again. Hallelujah. I'm glad that you could join us for this special Easter Sunday celebration and I'm especially delighted to welcome as our speaker J. John. Now J. John is a wonderfully creative speaker with an appeal to people of all ages, any gender, any race, any culture, any language. His message, the way that he speaks and communicates, touches every type and condition of person. And I know you're going to enjoy him uh, speaking today as he tries to answer this question. Why Easter? What's so significant about Easter? Why is it so important? That's something for us to look forward to later in the service. But first of all, Keith and Christine Getty are going to begin our service with us as they sing appropriately, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Listen and enjoy, join in if you know this song. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed.
Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of hope you gave us on Easter morning. Because of you, we know that no problem is too difficult and even death has no power over us. Thank you for the gift of joy you gave us when you rose from the grave. Because of you, we know that no matter how hard life may seem, we can never finally be defeated. Thank you for the gift of love you gave us when you laid down your life. Because of you, we know that there is no sin too great to separate us from your love, for we are incredibly valuable to you. Thank you for the gift of life you gave us when you walked out of the grave that Easter Sunday morning. Because you died and rose again, we know that this is just the beginning and that we will spend eternity with you in the glory of heaven. This Easter day, we celebrate with hearts full of praise and thanksgiving. For you are our Saviour, Lord and Friend. Amen. This morning's reading is from John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. 
He bent over her and looked in at the strips of linen, lying there but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but did not realise that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying, and who is it you are looking for? Thinking it was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. So she turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have yet not ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her.
Easter to all of you. Why Easter? What a good question and that's what we're going to look at now. Most heroes wear a cape. My hero wore a cross. Jesus didn't come for an excursion but he came for an execution. I know I'm not perfect but Jesus thinks I am to die for. Jesus Christ is my hero. Jesus made some astonishing claims about himself. So, for example, he said, I am the true vine. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the Good Shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. How do we know those statements are true? There is the famous story of Mallory and Irvin who tried to climb the summit of Everest in 1924. They got very close to the summit, but never made it back. Irvin's body was found in 1999. Precisely because they didn't return, no one knows whether they were actually the first people to climb the world's highest mountain. We know Jesus' statements are true because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The Bible teaches Christ, who was dead, is alive, not a Christ who was alive and is dead. In the Bible, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 3, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scriptures said he was seen by peter and then by the 12 after that he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time most of whom are still alive though some have died 
Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles, last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Why would the apostles lie? Liars always lie for selfish reasons. If they lied, what was their motive? What did they get out of it? What they got out of it was misunderstanding, rejection, persecution, torture, and martyrdom. Hardly a list of perks. Jesus' resurrection authenticates everything he said and everything he did. In the 18th century, there was a man called Gilbert West and he was having a conversation with a number of friends discussing Christianity. And Gilbert West said, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to attack Christianity and I'm going to disprove Christianity and I'm going to write a book disproving that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He took this very seriously and began researching and began re writing his book. But what happened? In the process of writing his book, he met the crucified, risen Jesus Christ and he wrote his book the other way around. I've got one of the original copies. Here's his book, written in the 18th century. Proof that Jesus Christ is alive. In the 19th century, a man called Lou Wallace, who was a general in the American army, was asked by a friend of his, who was an atheist, whether he would, because of his high profile, whether he would write a book against Christianity, a write a book to disprove the resurrection. And so he too began to research and began to write his book. But by the time he got to chapter four, he met the crucified, risen Jesus Christ. And then he wrote his book the other way round. His book is called Ben-Hur. You may have seen the film. In the 20th century, a lawyer and a journalist called Frank Morrison, he decided that he would disprove Christianity. And the only way you can do that is to disprove the resurrection. He was a lawyer, he was a journalist. He, he knew how to find what he needed for to argue his case, but, and he knew how to play around with the material. But in the process of writing his book, he met the crucified, risen Jesus Christ. And Frank Morrison wrote his book, The Other Way Round. It's called Who Moved the Stone? Many people who've endeavoured to explore whether Jesus Christ rose from the dead have discovered that he is alive. If Jesus rose from the dead, then we have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not we like his teaching, but whether or not Jesus rose from the dead and therefore he is the truth and his teaching is true. Christianity is not true because it works. It works because it is true. 
The resurrection of Jesus is the cornerstone to a worldview that provides the perspective to all of life. Jesus' resurrection makes it possible for us, for you, for me, to move towards the light and the love of God. I like what C.S. Lewis, a professor at Oxford who was once an atheist, but then encountered the crucified risen Jesus, wrote this. I believe in Christianity as I believe in the sun has risen, not because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. To understand the implication of Easter Day, we need to understand Good Friday. Easter reminds us of the problem of humanity, that we need rescuing. Easter reminds us that for all of our technological triumphs, for all our intellectual successes, we are moral failures and we need rescuing. The Bible records in 1 Timothy chapter 2, there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. You see, you and I, we are all battling with a virus called COVID-19. But we are all battling with another. It's called sin. And we need to understand what that little word means. It basically means failing to do what God has commanded us to do and doing what has been forbidden for us to do. All of us have done that. You see, before we can see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. St. Paul in the Bible says, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. All the, the sin that we've done, all the wrong that we've done, it works a bit like an overdraft in a bank account. And if you have an overdraft and I have an overdraft, you can't help me, I can't help you. That's why Jesus Christ came into this world to die on a cross, because by dying on a cross, it was as if he was cashing a check, signed with his own blood to say, here's the check to clear your overdraft so that you could be forgiven. The great artist Rembrandt, a Christian who had a deep awareness of his own failings, painted a fascinating crucifixion scene called The Raising of the Cross in 1633. It has a typically dark background with the light falling on two central figures. One is Jesus nailed to the cross. The other is a man who is identifiable as Rembrandt himself. It was his way of saying, 
I did this. I am a participant in Christ's death. And that is true for you and for me. It was because of our sin that disconnected us from God, that Jesus came to die, to forgive and reconcile us. If the cross was just the death of Jesus, it would be the bleakest image in history. It is not Bad Friday, but Good Friday. Christians use the cross as a symbol, not because it commemorates tragedy, but because it commemorates triumph. Jesus died with us and he died for us. The Easter story is of a God who gets involved with us. It's very common to imagine God as remote and distanced, like a satellite in the sky, distantly observing us without concern. But Easter tells us that God gets alongside us. He becomes one of us, even in the worst possible situation. At the horrifying sight of the cross, with all its terrible suffering, God is there. A father and his young son were driving down a country road on a beautiful spring day. Suddenly, a bumblebee flew in the car window. Since the little boy was allergic to bee stings, he became petrified. His father quickly reached out, grabbed the bee and squeezed it in his hand and then released it. But as soon as he let it go, his son became frantic once again as it buzzed around the car. The father saw his son's fear once again. He reached out his hand, but this time he pointed to his hand. There, stuck in his hand, was the sting of the bee. You see this, he asked. You don't need to be afraid anymore. I've taken the sting for you. You and I, we do not need to be afraid of death because Christ has taken the sting out of death and sin. One of my favourite stories is the one of the famous artist who went back to the very small rural community where he was born and brought up. And he's just walking around some of the village stores, sees an antique shop, looks in the window, cannot believe what he sees. He sees one of his paintings. It was one that he'd painted years before he was famous. The frame was broken, the picture was dirty, the picture was scratched. It was his, but he couldn't go into the antique shop and say, that's my painting, give it back to me. If he wanted it back, he had to buy it back before he could clean it, restore it and reframe it. That is exactly what God did in Jesus. He bought us back to clean us, to restore us, and to reframe us. Jesus came to pay a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. It was love, 
not nails that kept Jesus on the cross. Christ's crucifixion as the Son of God allowed our adoption as children of God. Christ went to a place of separation so that we might never need to be separated from God. Christ became empty so that we might become filled. Christ became nothing so that we can become something. That is what the cross is about. Our old history ends with the cross. Our new history begins with the resurrection. We have a great need for Christ and we have a great Christ for our need. The cross is the only door that opens to heaven. The cross is the only passage into God's presence. Why Easter? Without the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there would be no hope in this world. Christ's resurrection is the source of hope. Without Christ, we have a hopeless end. But with Christ, we have an endless hope. Christian hope is a certainty guaranteed by God himself. No matter how devastating our struggles, our disappointments, our troubles are, they are only temporary. No matter what happens to you, no matter the depth of tragedy or pain you face, no matter how death stalks you and your loved ones, Easter promises you and me a future of immeasurable good. Easter gives your life and my life meaning. Easter gives your life and my life direction. Easter gives your life and my life the opportunity to start over no matter what our circumstances. Easter is summed up in this one Bible verse, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God is offering us through Jesus Christ, forgiveness from the past, new life here today, and a hope for the future. We're all being given an invitation this Easter week by Jesus Christ. Have you accepted your invitation. I accepted my invitation on the 9th of February 1975 when I was a student in London. 
my friend Andy showed me in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, where it says, Jesus stands at the door of a house knocking. And if you hear the knock, open the door and let Jesus in. And I remember my friend Andy said to me, have you heard Jesus knocking on your door? And I said, I think so. He says, have you opened the door? I said, well, I don't know where the door is. He said, don't worry about that. Ask Jesus to break the door down. And so I did. I knelt beside my bed on the 9th of February, 1975. The first time I can ever remember me kneeling or praying. And I prayed. I prayed that Jesus would break the door down. I prayed that I would experience his death and resurrection in my life. I prayed that I would experience forgiveness, new life and a hope. And I did. And I'm more convinced than I've ever been all these years later because I know him. I know the crucified, resurrected Jesus who has set me free. If you want to open the door of your life this Easter time, then wherever you are, wherever you're listening, wherever you're tuned in, whether you're sitting or standing or kneeling, pray these words with me now. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you, Jesus, that you rose from the dead. Thank you, Jesus, that you are alive today. I come to you just as I am. I know I have done many things wrong. And I ask you to forgive me. Cleanse my life. Set me free from the past. I invite you now into my life. Come in by your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your peace, your presence and your power. Thank you that I can have forgiveness from the past, that I can have new life today and I can have a hope for the future. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for answering my prayer. Amen. A prayer for you. I pray for everyone that echoed or prayed that prayer. I pray that they would know the truth and the reality of the prayer that was prayed. I pray that you would experience cleansing and forgiveness. I pray that you will be filled with the presence of his Holy Spirit. I pray that you would know well-being in body, mind and spirit, and you would know his protection. And I pray God's blessing upon you, the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you did pray that prayer, wonderful. And it's the beginning of a new day, of a new season in your life. And whether you prayed the prayer for the first time or you prayed it as a way of reaffirming your faith, can I encourage you to read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John in the New Testament of the Bible and, and read the teaching of Jesus and read about the life of Jesus uh, and allow his words to guide you in your next steps. Happy Easter.
A big thank you then to Jay John for that wonderfully illuminating and inspiring talk about what Easter means today, helping us to understand what it's all about, that through Jesus' death and resurrection we can have forgiveness for the past, we can have new life for today, and we can have fresh hope for the future. Now if you prayed with J. John at the end of his talk, I'd love to hear from you. You can contact us through our website. Go to fvfc.org.uk and go to the contacts page. Just leave me a message there telling me that you prayed the prayer with J. John today. And if you're not a regular churchgoer, I'd love to send you a copy of the New Testament so that you could follow J. John's advice and start reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So put your name and address in that space and I'll make sure that you get a copy of the New Testament to help you begin that journey of faith. Also, a good friend of mine wrote this great book called Who Do You Say I Am? A question that Jesus once asked his disciples. It's a beautifully illustrated book, very easy to read and very helpful to understand exactly who Jesus is, why he came, what he's done and how we can know him. So if you leave your contact details uh, and you are not a regular churchgoer at the moment, then I'll send you a copy of the New Testament and a copy of this book completely free of charge. A little Easter gift for you to help you on your journey. So thank you ever so much for listening and watching today and God bless you wherever you're watching or listening from and I hope we'll be able to interact with each other in the days to come. And now a final blessing as we close. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way and may your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless until that day when our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God who calls you is faithful and he will do this. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I look forward, hopefully, to seeing you again very soon. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong? Who holds our days within His hand? What comes apart from His command? And what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Unto the shore, the rock.
Christ he lives, Christ he lives, and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him, there we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed, and we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours.